Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest on today's episode is an old friend of mine, someone I've known for almost 30 years, Chaim Galfand. Uh, Chaim started out his career after Penn Law School. We were both uh, alumni, we are both alumni of Penn Law. He started out as a lawyer in a uh, commercial law firm here in Philadelphia. And then at some point, as he describes it, he felt a hunger for something else and something different, deeper even, which led him to going back to school to become trained and learned as a rabbi. And he's now the rabbi and educator at a Jewish day school outside of Philadelphia. And it's this is something a little different, but fascinating to hear about somebody who is doing something different with the law and has a different perspective on the law. We talk about a lot of the connections, if you will, between uh, how we understand American law and how American law functions and how religious law comes also down through the generations and evolves and changes, uh, hopefully bending along the arc of history towards progress and goodness. Um, really great, inspiring, and uh, warm conversation with an old friend, Haim Galfand. I hope you will enjoy this episode. And as I'm now taking the saying, I hope you will make plans for how you will vote in November, that you take steps that you can take now to make sure that your vote uh, is safe and will be protected, whether that's uh, registering online, making sure that you're registered if you already have, securing a mail-in ballot, or planning to uh, vote in person. And also, since uh, this pandemic is not simply going to evaporate, I read a thousand students at the University of Alabama have tested positive since school resumed there. So we know this is out there and I hope everyone will do what we need to do to stay safe, importantly, to wear masks and socially distance and just be careful and take care of each other. Thank you again and please enjoy this episode of Good Law, Bad Law. I want to welcome my guest today, Chaim Galfand, or I should really say Rabbi Chaim Galfand. Uh, Chaim, welcome. It's nice to be with you. Uh, Chaim, you and I have known each other, I think, for almost 30 years. It goes uh, back to the uh, early 90s, for sure. That's right. And uh, occasionally on this podcast, we take a little bit of a departure from taking on a complicated Supreme Court case or a complex legal issue to uh, get to know somebody who's doing something interesting and different with the law. I take a very expansive view of the scope of this podcast. And so uh, when I saw an article the other day in the Penn Law Alumni Magazine, we are both alumni of uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School that you'd written uh, reflecting on uh, some of the things you're thinking about today. I thought, well, that would be, I would be so, first of all, it would be so great to reconnect with you. It's been a few years. <clears throat> and to uh, talk about your story and your journey from lawyer to rabbi and what and and to educator as well and uh, I don't really have a whole lot of uh, a script or plan for our conversation other than that but I thought it can't be bad and it'll be interesting and different uh, and uh, maybe even inspiring to some folks uh, listening and watching now that we're on YouTube so that's that is the entirety of my agenda this morning. That's an easy um, agenda for me to follow. It is great just to be with you. And if this does provide some food for thought for the listeners, then that's terrific. That's the idea. So, uh, well, let's start with who you are today. And then I want to rewind the clock all the way back to uh, the time as you were coming out of Penn Law, became a lawyer, and then made a pretty dramatic shift in your work and your whole life, really, to do something very, very different. Uh, but tell us, uh, first of all, so people know who you are and what you do now, and then we'll, we'll, we'll turn back the clock. Perfect. So I am presently an ordained rabbi through the conservative movement. That's one of the denominations of Judaism. And I work for Perlman Jewish Day School, and they are a 
two school system located in the Philadelphia suburbs. And we educate students from pre-K through fifth grade. And I've been with Perlman Jewish Day School as their school rabbi, which is um, now a more common role. But when I first took the role, it was something that was really not much heard of in the Jewish school systems. And I've been with Perlman since uh, 2001, which was the year in which I had my ordination. Wow. So. so your entire career as a rabbi, you've also had this role within a school, but not, so not only being a rabbi, but you also have an educational function as well within the school. Right, so within the school itself, my job takes on several different uh, you know, facets. On its most basic level, I do go in and out of every single classroom. So whether it is from our pre-K or our fifth graders, I will be in the classroom for a full period, at least once a week, where I am teaching kids directly. And that's been a core part of my job since 2001. At the same time, I'm also administrating at the school. And in my role as an administrator, that involves overseeing Jewish life at the school, which mm -hmm. as the equivalent of a parochial school, mm -hmm. um, we have both ritual, we have belief, we have matters of sacred text. And so all of those are gonna fall within my purview. At the same time, I also have several different uh, constituencies, I guess I would say. Mm -hmm. I don't just sort of teach the, uh, the short folks at our school. Uh -huh. uh, I'm also there for families and I'm there for our faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. And when we think that, uh, well, how often can that sort of bring itself to the point where my services might be needed? Let's just take the issue that, um, you know, when you mentioned the Penn Law uh, Alumni Journal, it was a question of what does faith look like in the time of COVID-19? Mm. In other words, when people come to school as a teacher, let's say, they're bringing with them their bag with their computer and their notes and the books they're gonna read, but we all bring other sorts of baggage every day as well. And in this time where we're worried about ourselves, we're worried about our families, um, we're worried about our interactions with the kids and what they're bringing from their homes. Uh, and sometimes that is a lot to have to shoulder. And so well, it's kind of good if you have somebody else's shoulder to kind of lean on and talk that through. Yeah, and again, I take a very expansive view of the law, and this is a, this is a podcast about the law, and I'm immersed in the law every day in what I do professionally. Uh, but there's always seemed to me to be something about um, even every Jewish person's connection to their Judaism but especially a rabbi's connection because we speak of the Torah, the Jewish Bible as the law. It is the law. So how do you, I mean, how do you think about that in the context of what you've been doing for the last 20 years? So in many ways, when I think about the law, it does take me back to when I did make a shift from uh, American law to Jewish law. And my understanding then is very different than it is now. And where I've placed the emphases is very different. Mm -hmm. And this overlaps into a lot of different areas. Um, you know, if I were to sort of rewind that clock, I, I graduated from University of Pennsylvania School of Law in 1989. And my very first job and only job was with Mezerov, Gelman, Jaffe, Kramer, and Jameson, a Philadelphia law firm. And uh, it, it has since dissolved and merged in other places. But it was a wonderful environment where coming out of law school, I could sort of take the background of how you research something, how you think it through, and put it into play on the piece of paper. And that worked itself fine for, for years. And the shift began to happen actually um, just a little bit before you and I met. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that there was one night and I was at the law firm. We had a beautiful library at our building. And uh, so it was around 6 p.m., you know, when the, the second half of the day starts for a first year associate. <laughs> right. And I was on my way to the library and the managing partner uh, of the firm, Mr. Jaffe, stopped and said, um, you're Jewish. I, I need you to come with me, which is yeah. quite an opening line. It sure is. It has nothing to do with my job. Yeah. And I said, what's going on? He said, well, uh, I'm involved with this organization. It's called the American Jewish Committee. And we're hosting a gathering in our library tonight. 
And I said, oh, I was just heading there. And he said, well, we've kind of co-opted the space, but I need to make sure that I've got a presence. I need bodies. Okay, so the firm's managing partner is going to say, I need you to go up to this meeting. It has to do with something Jewish, and you're Jewish, so you will be there. And I went. And it turned out the organization is a fantastic organization, and it ultimately deals with civil rights and human rights. Mm -hmm. So I went, and I, I stood around, and I listened, and I had some of the crudité, and I talked with some <laughs> of the folks. And when it was all wrapping up, uh, one of the representatives said to me, so um, maybe you want to get involved. And of course, my first thought was, well, client development, I can bring in some business, I'll get involved in one more organization. And I've put my name down on a piece of paper. And mm -hmm. sure enough, I get a phone call. And they said, we'd love to get you involved. And I said, that sounds fine. And they said, but we want you to help with something that's not yet in place. I said, what would it be? And I said, well, we're getting to be a little old. We're graying a little bit. Our yeah. members are long in the tooth. We'd like to maybe help start a young adult division. Yeah. Well, I didn't have much experience, except that is to say that I had my Jewish identity because my own roots go back to Perlman Jewish Day School where I'm presently the school rabbi. That's the school that I went to. Mm. So in some ways I had this base of experience that kind of activated. And I got involved with the American Jewish Committee and uh, my wife, Kelly, also became involved and several others like yourself were in and out of this organization. And mm -hmm. we created its mission statement. We created its programming. And what I often found, which came as a surprise, was that while there were several legs on which this young adult division was going to stand, that there seemed to be this interest in young Jewish professionals in Philadelphia learning a little bit more about their own Judaism yeah. and learning about themselves. And so really in the format of a salon type of discussion or a living room sort of a class, we would start to unpack and learn a little bit more. And I, I felt like it was activating long dormant things that were within me. And you know, the law as, a, as an associate um, demands a lot of your time. And this began pulling more and more of my time. But more important, I guess, was that it was it was feeding something that was in me. Well, and, you know, I'm, it, it's, uh, it's so interesting to look back on that. And I was uh, also involved at the time as you were, and we worked together. That's where you and I first met. And we called, we called the little group that we were starting Bridges. And just as you've been describing what we, I don't know that we fully understood exactly what we were doing, but as we stumbled our way through, we were making connections. And I think about that a lot now, 30 years later, 25 years later, making connections is a big part of what we, what we do as lawyers. I mean, we research, we find cases that help support an argument we're trying to make. We try to connect to a judge or to a jury if we're in the courtroom. We try to uh, connect to our client and to, to the story that we want to tell uh, their story. And uh, of course, in all human relations, that's what we're doing too. And uh, so th that idea, uh, how, how and, and we make connections with, with uh, people who come from very different backgrounds. And that was a big focus at Bridges was to, uh, as, you, as you said, it's, it has a very strong human rights and civil rights mission and how do we make connections not only with each other in our group and with ourselves but also with other people who, who may come from very, very different places so so this idea of connection i think is is so uh, is so powerful and and runs through connects through so much of what we do i wonder how that may have played into some of your thinking as you were starting to question uh, is, is actually being a lawyer doing what I'm doing in my lawyering life, uh, satisfying that pull? There's no, there's no question that those connections, those bridges were super important. And sometimes you would have that, you would generate it and you wouldn't know where it was going to lead you. So you'd see the bridge in front of you and you'd start moving down it. As a lawyer, I'm not saying that I didn't have connections with my clients. 
there were people on the other ends of these legal issues. But was I making a difference? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, yes, I, I was. I mean, I began my career uh, with employee benefits law. And in some ways, I could say that that was a win-win sort of a type of law. You know, if I'm doing my job correctly and I'm interpreting the tax regs properly, then the corporation is going to get its, its tax break and the employees are going to get their employee benefit and everybody is going to be happy. Mm -hmm. And so you can step back and say, I'm, I'm doing a good job. Mm -hmm. But there was something in it maybe that wasn't beginning to nourish a hunger that had started to grow with my involvement with this incredible group of minds and hearts of this um, subcommittee, this subpart of the American Jewish Committee. Mm -hmm. And as that, ha that, that hunger began to grow with me. And I, I actually went to talk to my father about it. And my father had been a lawyer for many, many years. And he said, so what do you want to do about it? And I said, I'm not sure. I said, I know I went to law school, but I said, I think I might, I think I might want to get involved in teaching. And he said, teaching Jewish stuff. And I said, yes. He said, well, I'd, I'd want to ask you one important question. He said, would you be being pushed out of the law? Is it that you're frustrated by the law? Mm -hmm. Is it that yeah. you were, you're unhappy? And I said, no, because after reflection, I realized I'm being pulled. Yeah. I'm being drawn to something. And I didn't immediately act on that. Another year went by after that conversation. And by then I started to think about a degree in Jewish education. And one year after that, my father passed away. Mm -hmm. And in the process of mourning for my father, I began to get a few more contacts with some area rabbis. And those conversations led to my desire to maybe have a deeper education, which was to pursue rabbinic study, which you know, three years of law school was lovely. But <laughs> six years of rabbinical school, yeah. uh, that really added to, to the amount of time that I spent in a, in a classroom. Yes. And when I began my time as a rabbinical student, the law seemed central. And this is important because I was married to Kelly and still am, but I was married to Kelly who had married at the time a fairly secular lawyer mm -hmm. with a very specific career trajectory. And now all of a sudden I was saying, I, I'm, I'm drawn to do this. It's going to have a religious dimension within the area of Jewish law. There's going to be a lot of ritual and taking that on is going to impact our lives. It's going to impact the timing of our week because of the laws of the Sabbath. It's mm. going to impact what we eat because of the Jewish dietary laws. And I can just imagine her sort of sitting there going, mm hmm. Okay. Is this, wow. what, I, is this what I bargained for? <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't get my name on that contract. Right, right. And fortunately she said, then if this is important to you, let's give it a try. Yeah. But as I did that, I was still not yet anchored. I was going in and out of all of the boats that were in the marina, but I hadn't yet set down my own. And I guess I took my, my compass points from what I thought was a fixed sense of Jewish law and its overriding importance. I remember at one point, it was in our first year, and the holiday of Passover came along. Now, at that time, I don't think I understood that there is a lot more flexibility to Jewish law than people typically give credit to. And so I adopted a strand of Jewish law, which ended up leaving my kitchen in the most strict and strenuous sorts of preparations. And I remember I had a bathtub and this will be odd for your listeners, filled with all of our drinking glasses, changing the water every, three, every, every day for a total of three days. As I look back on that, I understand that's one way of interpreting how you prepare your glass utensils for this holiday of Passover. Mm -hmm. But I now realize there's more than one way. And it's not just that there is the denominational setting within Judaism where you say, okay, there are different slices of Jewish life. Even within those slices, Jewish law is varied. And in some ways, this reflects itself back to the practice of American law. 
Yes. You know, it could be that you say, I've got to get to the, the basis for this ruling. But what you don't realize is that this federal court and this federal court are coming at opposite conclusions, but they're looking at the same body of law. Yes. Now, well, there is this small thing that I, I'm sure you've talked about many times on your podcast, the Supreme Court, which is able to be a final arbiter, which can be very helpful. Would that Jewish law had such a thing? Well, that's interesting. I want to, and I want to uh, hear more about that. But just to ch chime in on the point you're making, it's, I think it is a misconception that probably a lot of people uh, have about law. We think there's the law and that answers all questions about what we should and shouldn't do or what should happen or not happen in a particular situation. Um, I have found the same in, in 25 years now of, uh, of, of practicing law. We say practicing law, actually, which is also kind of funny. You know, we don't say, if it was just that easy, we'd look up in a book or on our phones now and we'd say, here's the answer to the question. But we practice law because it takes practice, yes, but also because there are no clear and obvious answers. Um, I can't, couldn't even count the number of times I've face some problem in a case and and just sat there and, and and shook my head and said why hasn't this ever been answered why is this does this feel like such an open field for interpretation and therefore argument but you know that's the, the same parallel by the way goes life. to what i would call myself somebody would say you know are, are you religious and i'll say i'm a practicing jew yes i practice judaism so I've moved from one practice to another. Right. And at its, at its essential level, they're both based on the law. Exactly. But at the same time, there is beyond the law, there's a whole other dimension. You know, we might say, I can stick to the black letter of the law, but it's really going to bring me to the wrong conclusion, at least morally. And that can hold with Judaism. It could be that you're following every aspect of the law, but you might not be a great person. You might, you might be checking all the boxes of the rituals that you have to do and the blessings that must be recited and the practices in your life that you have to engage in, but you still might be a rotten person. And Well, and you know, there's, there's the, I'm hardly as learned as you are in these in these matters, but there is the great story of Rabbi Akiba who was asked, could he could he explain everything one needs to know about Judaism while standing on one leg? Meaning quickly, briefly, concisely. And you know the story. I mean, what is he, what does he say? He ultimately says that it's all in how you treat people. So I'll just I'll just add a correction. So it ended okay. up being Hillel only because <laughs> Oh my that's okay. The fact that you know this great story from the Talmud, but I, I will actually tell you the story of Rabbi Akiva because it, it's, uh, I, first of all, I wanted to get some great credit. No, but Hillel basically said, yes. you know, you want me to tell you the entire essence of what this world of Judaism is about, and I have to do it on one foot, which was the idea of be concise. Right. And he said, what is, harm, what is uh, hateful to others, you know, do not do. Right? What you see as hateful, don't do to other people because in your interactions with other people, that is really the essence of where Jewish life and learning lies. Right. Now he then added, he said, the rest, the rest is commentary. Now go and learn. Right. And what this potential convert really admired was that he wasn't sugarcoating it. He was saying, yes, I can point you to something and yet you're going to have to invest so much more. And I do think that so many of the legal intricacies of Jewish life are meant to funnel you to a point where your interactions with other people are on a high moral ground. They're also meant to help you cultivate a relationship, not just with people, but with God. Mm -hmm. And I, I've recently made a turn in my own practice as an educator. And it came because I realized I, you know, I, I, I was conveying information well to my students. And I believed that I was also somehow reaching a part of their souls and not just their minds. But it's much harder to tackle 
the area of the spirit and of the soul, because it's, it's not the realm of words on a page. You know, so if, if the Jewish people are people of the book, what does that say about the soul? And mm -hmm. I've turned more in the last really year and a half, and I'm now about to embark on a focus within our school mm -hmm. of an initiative that's called Make Room for God. And I say that understanding that God can mean many different things. It's going to be potentially a connection to that which is beyond yourself. It's to get us outside of just that self-centeredness. And whether people call it spirituality, whether they call it a higher power, or whether they call it by God as the specific name, I want to say there is the law, but there is so much more. Right? We're, well, we're so accustomed and, to Jewish life. They say, oh, do you belong to a synagogue? Right? That may be an important question. But prayer exists beyond the walls of the synagogue. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I can't help kind of going back and forth between some of your reflections on Jewish law and how that's, uh, how that's a part of what you do and you've been thinking about for 20 plus years, but also how that connects back to the law generally, to American law. I mean, thinking about uh, when you talk about the soul and the spirit, we might think that the law is cold, it's <laughs> rigid, it's just words on a page, a statute, you know, uh, a text. But there are moments, I, I think the, the best moments actually in how law is expressed. Um, I'm, th I'm thinking in particular uh, of a, a, a very recent example, which was Justice Kennedy's opinion in the Obergefell case uh, on uh, recognizing a constitutional right in same-sex marriage. He didn't just as, uh, analyze a text. He didn't even just look to the language of the Constitution. He really talked so eloquently and beautifully about dignity, human dignity. And to think that that's an idea that informs the law, I, I think is, is, is really something remarkable and beautiful. And I, and I, I you know, I think that ties back to, to what you're talking about too. It's not, you know, it's not, Jewish law isn't just about a set of rules, a commandments, and not even just about the commentary of those who've interpreted uh, those, those rules since the time of Hillel, uh, as I stand corrected. But it is, it is about the human, um, the humanness, the humanity uh, of how, how those issues and problems get worked out in, in interaction, whether it's interaction between humans among a community of people or, with, or as you say, with God. There, to go back to Akiva, because you mentioned Rabbi Akiva, he lives 1400 years after the time of Moses. And we think of Moses as the one who stands at the mountain at Sinai and he gets the law from God. Right. And it's this immutable uh, fixture in, the, in Jewish life. And there's a story that's recounted in the very extensive book of volumes called the Talmud. And that's one of what's on the wall behind me is, uh, mm -hmm. is 63 volumes of it. And it tells a tale, fanciful or otherwise, of Moses being transported to the future, mm -hmm. right? So it's back to the future into the house of study, the house of study of Rabbi Akiva, 1400 years later. And Moses finds himself in the back row now, the way that they arranged the classroom was the smarty pants, they were in the front row. <laughs> and if you were kind of second, second chair, okay, yeah. he was in the back. Yeah. Okay. Because he may have been there for the front, but there had been so much development that had taken place. Because it's not just the written law, but there's the oral dimension of it, where it's passed down through the years and people begin to add on their layers based on both experience and the exigencies of what life demands at that point. And Moses finds himself bewildered because Rabbi Akiva is propounding this law and Moses can't get it. He can't feel the texture of it mm -hmm. until at some point Rabbi Akiva says, and we know this because it was a law given 
to Moses at Sinai. And Moses breathes a sigh of relief to understand that what had begun so long ago ultimately culminates in something which may not be recognizable to him, but which he hears is part of an unbroken line of continuity. Mm -hmm. And we see the same thing now. So for example, if we look back to the, the basic document, right, the founding document for Judaism, we call it the Torah, the five books of Moses. And in it, and this will be familiar to those listeners who know their Ten Commandments, is that they're supposed to observe the Sabbath. They're not supposed to do any work. Mm -hmm. The only question is, what's work? <laughs> is that going to include what I do in my day job? Is that going to include when I'm working in the garden? What about if I'm working out? And the Torah, the basic document, doesn't give the answer. Right. And it only comes later on. So there's a second layer that's called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah says, oh, well, we look back to certain biblical examples of labor, and let's take one of them, threshing. You'll take the grain, you're going to rub it over kind of a screen, and you're going to get off the outer husk. Okay, fine. Threshing. I can get this. I can't thresh. Oh, but wait, then along comes the Gemara, which is a second layer that comes behind this book, the Mishnah. Where am I going? Mm -hmm. Extrapolation. And they say, yes, threshing. Threshing is where you're trying to get to the center of something you know, like a lemon, where you want the juice on the inside. So, you know, you can't put lemon in your tea on the Sabbath because that's a form of work because it's connected to threshing, which is going back. Oh my you goodness. see where this is going. <laughs> and you could start to say, really? I'm going to drive myself nuts with all of these intricacies. But I also, I want the listeners here, I want you to hear, and I want myself to reiterate that it's all about heightening your awareness. And the question is, of what are you aware? And if somebody is only aware of their punctiliousness in adhering to the law, that they miss out on the human connection. Because to me, ultimately, those laws of the Sabbath, if they don't culminate in being part of a community and welcoming others into your home or sharing and breaking bread at someone's table, you know, which God willing will soon do again in the days of a vaccine, yes. um, then I think we've missed the mark. And that's a sadness that worries me. But you are so right to point out the fact that the law, when done right, incorporates the dignity of others. It takes into account morality. And there will some who say that when Judaism changes its practice, that morality has been placed on the scale of how you weigh to make that legal decision. And there will be denominations of Judaism that say, no, 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 the morality doesn't enter into this. But it's not correct the speed with which the law should change, that can be subject to debate. And my own denomination, that of conservative Judaism, and don't mistake it for being conservative versus liberal, it's not that side. It's the idea of conserving what was. Mm -hmm. And the, the, sub, uh, the subtext of my denomination talks about tradition and change. They want to conserve that which came before, but also allow for change. So for example, it says that you have to do whatever you can to adhere to the laws of Sabbath, and that might mean not making a fire. Okay, well, is not making a fire, nowadays, I, I haven't made a fire in a long time. <laughs> I turn on the stove. Would you even know how? I don't think I would. <laughs> exactly. I, I, was, I mean this in the best of ways. I'm no Boy Scout. Right. But um, we use gas that we ignite. We use electricity. Well, that has to now become something which people decide. Is this permissible? Is it not? Take something as what I, I'd like to think that people accept, the donating of one's organs. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the rabbis 2,000 years ago didn't have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. It wasn't within the realm of possibility. Mm -hmm. And so now I would want to say, so what does Jewish law say? And I'll give you three answers. And you might say, well, wait, wait, that can't be. It should be one answer. <laughs> it should be one answer. But here's the thing. We don't have a Supreme Court within the realm of Jewish law. And ultimately, it will be the entire corpus of Jewish law that has come before that serves as your basis. And the question is, so who gets to decide? Some denominations are going to put the power to decide within the hands of the individual. The more traditional branches, of which mine is part, will say it's in the hands of the judges of that generation. Mm. Now, the judges of this generation are the same ones that have been the judges for the last 
2,000 years, namely the rabbis. I don't know what the future holds, but it may be that just as the priesthood gave way to the rabbinic era, that the rabbinic era will give way to some other form of judging. Mm -hmm. And so now I can say there is an answer to go back to the idea of organ donation. One of them is Jewish law says that we may not desecrate a body. And if we have to cut open the corpse to remove these organs, we are desecrating a body and so that cannot be allowed. Right. That's one opinion. Another opinion says, ah, if you have a chance to save a life, yes. you must do so. So if by harvesting the organs from this person, I am able to save one or many lives, then I am permitted to do so. So you might say, well, that's only two. You mentioned three. One says no, and the other one says you're allowed. Then comes the third one, which says, not only are you allowed, but this rises to the level of a commandment. Mm. You are obligated to provide for the donation of your organs. Because if you do not take that step to save a life, then you are violating Jewish law. Interesting. So it takes us into a, another realm where, again, by following what that law can, can do, it allows for something which I think on a moral level, many of us might agree. Well, and you hope that the, the course of the way that law moves is, is, is a course of progress. I mean, you hope that there's, there's forward movement towards the ideals that we start with, whether it's American law or, or Jewish law, any law. Uh, your, your personal moral values. Um, uh, nobody in, is a perfect Boy Scout. Nobody is, as, as Christians would say, without sin. Um, as my mother used to say, nobody's perfect. You know, so, but, but what, what is the striving that we're doing? What, what is the direction we're, we're trying to move toward? Um, you know, there is a Supreme Court in American law, but this same Supreme Court said that said that blacks were property that former slaves were could 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 be that slaves could be returned to their owners because they were property um that same supreme court said separate can be equal you know so the same supreme court said we could put japanese americans in concentration camps during world war ii so supreme court has gotten it very wrong at times and then it's had opportunities to correct. And, and they've correct. always looked at the same core document. Obviously, That's there's right. much more than, more than just that. But there is perhaps reasonable ways to interpret things, you know, in so, their time. And it's tough to sort of not judge something from where we stand now with the hindsight that we have, uh, with the sensitivities that have been heightened. Um, you know, I think of a story just that takes its back to the Talmud. But uh, Hillel, the one who was on one, one foot, mm -hmm. um, Hillel's opposite was Shammai. And Hillel and Shammai debated constantly. And they often arrived at conflicting interpretations of Jewish law. And when they passed on, their students, their disciples, each were part of the house or, you know, the, the house of study of Hillel and the house of study of Shammai. And they continued on and on to reflect on their teachers uh, opinions. And they would often say, I declare that this is kosher. I declare this is not kosher. I declare that this person has a certain status. The other one says, I deny that status. And that would often be in the case of, well, is this person, for example, Jewish? Let's examine where they come from and are they of Jewish status such that they could be married under the law? And during the day, basically, in their day job, they would argue back and forth and sometimes bitterly. But in the proverbial end of the day, these two houses of students and disciples, they continued to marry their children one to the other, despite whatever disagreements and status they might have. They continued to eat from each other's tables, despite what the conflicting interpretation of what might be permissible under the dietary laws was. In other words, they never lost sight of the humanity of the person opposite them. And I, I know that there's bitterness that happens within our legal system. And it's not always easy to say, 
that somebody has arrived at a interpretation that we can be pretty angry about, but at least see where it came from. They can understand the wisdom of where it comes from, even if it personally grates against their sensibilities. Um, we had something like this, uh, you know, several years back within my denomination, because my denomination doesn't really have a Supreme Court, and yet, instead of leaving it up to the individual rabbi, there's a 25-member committee. And this committee on Jewish law and standards will gather to field questions. So for example, they might have a question that is posed to them that says, if you've got a Jewish woman and she has become pregnant using the donated eggs from a non-Jewish woman, what is gonna be the status of a child that she might have? All right, so a question that could not have been answered before, but now is very real. One of the questions that was asked came up with basically two questions. It was, what is the status of, uh, of people who are, uh, who are homosexual? Can they be ordained by our rabbinical schools? And here you have 25 rabbis who have to weigh in on something which is of absolute, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the life of people, right? And they had to weigh in on it. And there are sources to look at. And while those other layers that I mentioned that come later in the rabbinic era, it's tough to you know, just look at what goes back to the original biblical sources, which might seem to be very black and white. And ultimately in that time when the decisions were handed down, there were 12 people who came out to say, there's no way we can really make room for homosexuals to be ordained within our movement. And there were 12 that said, we can absolutely find space for um, homosexuals to be ordained in our movement. So you'd say 12 and 12, how did it fall? And the answer was both of those legal positions passed the committee yeah. because they each had 13 votes. Now, the, the- Okay, so where did the 13th vote come from? <laughs> it came from one rabbi who voted for both. I see. And he said, yes, I see your legal reasoning and your legal reasoning is correct. And then he turned and said, and your legal reasoning is correct as well. And on one level, there's something that you would almost say, but that's not right. That's somebody who's afraid to put themselves on the line. They're not going to take a stand, but this is somebody who said, I am gonna put myself on the line and I am going to take a stand for the fact that both of these positions are part of our legal discussion, and they both have something on which to rely. In some ways, some people were angered and others felt that this rabbi was very brave, maybe honest. Mm. It's, it's challenging, you know, and then ultimately I mentioned this initiative that I'm embarking on, Make Room for God. The question is really, where, where does God fall with, uh, within all of this? And there was, a, there was a discussion in the Talmud long ago, which talked about um, how the rabbis were discussing a certain object. It happened to be a stove that was made up of separate pieces. And when the pieces were put together, the question is, did it have the status of something which could become, in the biblical world, impurity was so important. Could it become impure or could it not? And one rabbi said, I declare that this is going to be impure. And the other one said, I declare that it's going to be pure. And they argued back and forth and back and forth. Now, it really happened that one rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer, said, you know, I disagree with all of you. I see that there's this consensus forming amongst, amongst all the rabbis. And so this one rabbi said, but I still think all of you are wrong. And he said, honestly, if I am right, may the stream that is outside our house of study reverse its course and flow backwards. And sure enough, the stream reverses course. And all the rabbis say, yes, we don't take proof from a stream. And so then he says, if I am right, then may the very walls of this house of study start to tumble. And the walls began to lean in and began to incline. And one of the other rabbis, Rabbi Joshua said, we don't take our laws from the walls. And in honor of both of them, the walls remained inclined. They neither continued more nor did they straighten up. But then the last piece was, was incredible. The one rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer says, if I am right, let there be a heavenly voice that actually points this out and reinforces it. And sure enough, in the corpus of Talmudic literature, the 
this voice that comes from above is heard several times. This is the most important story. A voice from the heavens comes and says, yes, the law is in accordance with Rabbi Eliezer. He is right and not the group. And the group of rabbis say, uh, we do not take our cues from a heavenly voice, but rather from the majority. And they said this saying that in every generation, God's own text has said it will be the prophet, it will be the rabbi, it will be the judge in every generation that gets to decide. Now, most people end the story right there, but what follows is sort of a coda mm -hmm. where it says that at some point, one of the rabbis bumped into Elijah the prophet. You get to have this in the Talmud where these wonderful threads start to weave through and said, oh, Elijah, you know, you're connected to, to God. What did God do at that moment? And Elijah said, God leaned back and laughed and said, my children have defeated me. My children have defeated me. <laughs> right. As if to say, yeah, you're right. You got me. I have taken something which is to be filled with sanctity, but I've given it over to you for your interpretation as if to say, even God has to abide by that. Hmm. Well, that's, a, that's a, such a, a, an important jumping off point to, to the, where I wanted to go next and, and maybe find a way to wrap up on this, because it brings us back to the present. Um, you spoke of division, uh, the division between these two camps of sort of founding fathers, so to speak, founding rabbis Hillel and Shammai. Um, we know that the founding fathers of our country had tremendous debates. They did not, they were not all of one mind on many things and some terrible compromises were reached but, and, and also some very wonderful and beautiful uh, compromises were made that, that we, we can still be very proud of today. But uh, in addition to COVID, it just, and this is not meant to be political or to point to any particular person or party, or, 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 but just to describe the times we're in as a time of really, I think, frightening division um, pro, you know, somebody was shot at a protest in Portland. Uh, there was a shooting in Kenosha. There are, uh, I was yelled at by a woman in a grocery store two days ago when I asked her as politely as I could to put on a mask and she turned on me, you know, violently and abusively, angrily. You know, there's, every day it feels like as a, as a society, division is, is, is winning and is taking over. Um, all the way back to our days when you and I first met, when we talked about building bridges, all these years later, it feels like bridges are just, are on fire. Um, what do you, I mean, what do you make of that and how, you know, I mean, you told the story about the rabbis at this, you know, Congress talking about, you know, um, gays as, as ordained members. You know, you could see somebody saying, I don't care what those rabbis said, that this is wrong. I'm angry that that's not something acknowledged and recognized. And the tr actual fact is in many conservative schools and, and synagogues, it, it is increasingly recognized, right? So, uh, I mean, look, I, I would answer you, you see what I'm saying? The, the, the level of uh, anger and sense of being divided from one another, alienated from one another, uh, it'd be trite to say, but it's also true that what Rabbi Hill, Hillel described while standing on one foot became what Christians call the golden rule, uh, the words of Jesus. So we, we know there's so much more in common that we share that what divides us, but it feels like the divisions are what are prevailing today. What I wish I could say that we have arrived at this in a in, in a new and awful way, but it is something that is as ancient as the tradition is. If you go back to 2000 years ago, when the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans was taking place, you had factions within the city among the Jews themselves. And some of them were saying, you know what, we just have to maybe capitulate. And mm -hmm. others would say, you know what, maybe we can get permission for a small group to sort of relocate within the land and keep the study alive. Yep. And there was another group who said, no, we must, 
show no quarter. We must fight to the end. And they did. And they did. So <laughs> there were those who were did. so on yeah. opposite sides. Yeah. I do think that I, I th everyone has to have a degree of what we call epistemological humility. And it's the idea of being humble. Meaning if I say, these are my beliefs, and I believe in truth. In fact, I believe that what I have is the only truth. Because there, some people might say you can have multiple truths. Maybe. But at some point, you have to say, what do I really believe in? I believe that what I have truth is truth. And what you have, that can't be truth. Mm. That's where we are now for many cases. But adding humility into the recipe looks like this. I believe that I have truth and that you don't. But I admit of the possibility that I may be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong, but I admit of the possibility. And within that realm of possibility, that's what allows me to engage with you and to listen. We need people who are so fixed in their beliefs to at least become a little more humble, to open themselves up to try to hear. Because when we are locked off and closed, I think that's when the terrifying stuff begins to happen. See, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. And I, I, I see where you're going. And maybe I'm uncomfortable with the part where even if you fold in humility to the recipe and say, I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that what I believe is the truth may not entirely be the truth. Or there's room for... Being, I may be wrong. I don't think I'm wrong, but I may be. That's the only possibility that you're wrong, wrong. Possibly, right. But it's, it's the part where to the other, you would say, and you don't have... What, what you believe is, is true is not true. That's the part... I mean, it, it, truth with a capital T and an absolute sense of what truth is leaves no room for any other truth leaves no room for any other expression can't it why can't it be and particularly in these times is a way to uh, look for ways for people to come together and and make those connections that we all know are so important be this is my truth and you have your truth now if your truth is fascistic, if your truth is hate-filled, if your truth is um, leaves no place or space for me as a human being, as a Jew, as a citizen, as a man, a woman, straight, gay, whatever it is, then I'm comfortable saying that's not true and I don't accept that. But uh, so how, how do, I guess the, the question is, how do we know? It's ultimately about dialogue is what I really meant. Not to say, and I think there are so many of us that are in that middle ground of where we can disagree and have conversations. But I think really to the most extreme ends uh, of this polarity, that we say there's simply no way that we can bridge that gap. But maybe if we can get some of those extremists who would say, I, I hold on to my truth and there's no possible way. They, as, if as many people can be drawn into conversation, mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's what helps. Mm -hmm. I, I do think that there are many times where I say what, what my tradition stands for is of such a moral level that I, I can't accept what this other group wants to say, wants to describe me as. And yet I can still find my way to have that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And that, that's all that really I, you know, I, I think back to, uh, you know, to, cause I remember you wrote a book that was about, uh, mm -hmm. uh, about a Nazi. Mm -hmm. And you know, th there was, there was um, going back, there was somebody who was asked a question, a rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Halevi Steinberg. He was asked the question of, so if this person has come to me and they're seeking to convert to Judaism and they say, well, I was a member of the Nazi party. Mm. Not only was I a member of the Nazi party, but I actually pushed people into the gas chambers. Yes. I actually smashed the skulls of, of Jewish babies. But 
I feel intense remorse and I want to become a member of the Jewish people. You know, you'd think that there could be no possible bridge between those areas, but the question was asked to the rabbi, is this somebody who might be an acceptable candidate for conversion, mm -hmm. right? So it brings into the issues of what is the law all about? Is there something that's beyond the law? Is there a way to bridge something? Do we ever recognize that what we think is so fixed and ugly that maybe there is the possibility of change? I'm an optimist, I know that. Um, Simon Wiesenthal tells a very similar story from his own experience <clears throat> uh, in his book, The Sunflower, but it, it, it involves more question of forgiveness, which I think is a whole other topic we could cover in a separate conversation. So, so you're an optimist, Chaim. I mean, with literal fires burning in California and hurricanes coming up from the Gulf and protests and worries about violence, you know, in many parts of the country. Uh, I drove through a rainstorm yesterday and felt hail bouncing off my windshield and I thought, another plague, uh, you know, and of course this pandemic we're in. Um, is there something about your experiences in the law, in your experiences in all the ways that you've thought about uh, what you've thought about that allows you to be optimistic in these times? And, and how does that express and what do you do with that? I think so much of what we believe shapes us. And even if it is, I don't know, some might say fanciful. I don't just say I am an optimist. I say I will remain optimistic. I will ultimately believe in the overwhelming good to be found within humanity. I will believe in the preponderance of wisdom that propels us to find vaccines for terrible diseases, that helps us to find ways that we can clean our environment and scrub it such that we can continue to exist and drive our vehicles. I have to say all of that is part of my worldview of saying, I believe in all of this. And I know that there are going to be the natural bumps in the road, be they storms or, or plagues. There will be the natural bumps in the road, like the people who cannot accept mm -hmm. somebody else's opinion. But I have to believe that the overwhelming weight of the preponderance of humanity will far outweigh all of that. There will be a price to be paid and there will be people and families that suffer. But I take the long-term view a lot of awful stuff has happened through history, and yet here we still are. Others would say, and we're at the worst part of history. We've had no. some terrible parts. No, we're not at the worst part. And I do Martin, that. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of history bends towards progress. I'm butchering, I'm butchering the quote, but that was the... That was the, I, I agree with you, and I think that our arc, our trajectory, is one that will take us to a better place. I'm, I feel so much better. <laughs> and... Thank you for that. And thank you so much for uh, what was a freewheeling uh, reflection on your life and career and on a lot of deep and important subjects. Um, it was so great to reconnect with you two and build a bridge back to you. And so I'm really appreciative and grateful. Thank you so much for being on Good Law, Bad Law. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm going to wish you it's early, but Best wishes for an upcoming Jewish New Year. May it be filled with all the hope and progress that you could possibly hope for. Thank you very much. And same to you.